And when the movie came out, it was instantly great. I mean, it was instant, uh, instantly profitable. And one of the coolest things about it was I didn't even release it for people to rent or purchase. How much money was going into your movies when you were dealing with the financiers? Um, you know, we, we always made sure we didn't spend more than 100. You know, we never spent more than 100. I really, unless you're shooting with massive names, or if you're shooting something that, I mean, of course, if it's something that is gonna use up most of the budget, like we, I just finished working with someone who was doing a film where, you know, it's dinosaurs and it's a very different thing, right? So so the, the, a lot of money is gonna go towards, you know, CGI and all that stuff. So, um, but if, if you're shooting the kind of movies that I shoot that rely on practical effects and, you know, things of that nature, and the stars are not huge and stuff like that. I don't believe it should go over 100. I believe if anytime you're going over 100, you're really rolling the dice. I think you're rolling the dice anyway, but you're really rolling the dice over 100 because I, I believe that it, with a s smart marketing plan, even with a bunch of flaws, um, you can make back 100. If you go to 250, you go to 350, and you don't have huge names attached, or if you don't have a whole lot of marketable elements, you could you could dig a hole that you can't climb out of. So it's always been under 100, and I try to keep most of my movies under 100. And if you factor in a lot of the, the discounts I receive on things, you could really see my budgets kind of coming in at around 250. You know, that, that's what they would be like if I was being charged full rate for a lot of things. So. And so 100, sorry, for the entire production, including post mm -hmm. and deliverables and, and prints and advertising and all yes. that? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And were all those films profitable that had financiers attached? I would say that in the beginning, no. They, didn't, they, became, they became more profitable after I got them back and after I marketed them myself. The reason being is this, and, I, and that's why I just gave a one answer, a one word answer of no. And the reason is because earlier on, I thought if I give my film to a distributor, then that distributor is going to market my film, they're gonna sell it all over the place, and then I'm just gonna rake in a bunch of money and it'll be awesome. And that's not really what happens. A distributor basically places your film and if no traffic gets driven to those places, you don't make any money. So ultimately it's your job, your responsibility as a filmmaker to drive traffic to that film or to, to drive traffic to those places where it can be purchased, right? Or rented or whatnot. So if you're not doing that, you're not making money. And if you, this, I mean, back in the day when sales agents really mattered, um, that sales agent could take the film and sell it here and sell it there and sell it there. But nowadays that doesn't really matter unless it's a huge film or it has a very huge name attached. Even those, those things don't matter. So you have to understand not only that it's your responsibility to do so, but you have to also understand how to accomplish it, how to drive traffic to those places so that you make money. So no, when those films were released, <clears throat> they were not profitable then, but they are profitable now. So it's not just enough to get a distributor to put it on iTunes or Google Play or whatever. You've gotta have a plan in place to get eyeballs to go to those links. Correct, correct. That was, that was one of the biggest lessons I had to learn. And not only learning that that was my job, but figuring out how to do it. Because it can be very tricky. It can be very tricky because the, the amount of films that are out, that are constantly coming out, is just crazy. And if you think about it, as, as filmmakers, most filmmakers think, oh, this person's in the film, this person, and all these people know other people, and everybody's talking about my film amongst each other. Oh man, I'm doing it, it's, it's huge. And it's like, no, because you're just talking to other people in the industry. And yeah, everybody else in the industry is talking about it, but 
they're really not your audience and they're really not the people who are going to make your film a success. They're not, unfortunately. The audience is, the people who you're marketing the film to in terms of a paying audience who that's their interest. That's, that, those are the people who you want to be aware of your film. Those are the people who you want talking about your film. And as I began to notice it more and more, I even took my own personal Facebook page down. I took it down because it was, for what I was doing, it was worthless and it was a waste of time. Because everybody who I knew worked in the industry and we all pumped each other up and oh, you're awesome. And that stuff doesn't <laughs> matter. That stuff does not pay the bills. You know, pumping each other's ego up is, that's all it's doing is pumping, pumping each other's ego up. So I got away from that completely and just started really focusing on how do I find my audience and how do I keep them engaged? And then how do I best convert that audience to a paying audience? How do I best do that? And those were things I just learned along the way. So maybe your audience, let's say, would be the people that would attend a horror convention in middle America mm -hmm. rather than people on either coast that are also looking to be cast. Correct. Okay. I, yeah, I but unfortunately, and you don't know it really on, on, on like when you're on a, like a media, social media platform like Facebook, everybody's friending you, friending you, like, oh, my movie's so popular, man. <laughs> and it's only after you sit back and you look at it that you realize, man, every single one of these people are either actors or composers. Like, wh what is this? Like, I got 7,000 friends, well, 5,000 friends and 4,800 of them are other actors and, and composers. You know, like that's that's the, the list of, uh, and, and, the, and that's not my audience. That's not who I'm really looking to, to convert. You know, those are the people who I'm looking to keep engaged. They're already engaged because they're looking for work, you know? So, you know, I had to learn how do I, how do I find my audience and how do I keep them engaged? How do I keep them happy? And I really started to notice when I got Axe Man back and I just kind of put out a blurb about it. Guess what guys, I got it back. And then everybody was like, oh, that's awesome, blah, blah, blah. And what are you gonna do now? And, oh, I'm gonna re-edit it. Oh, you're gonna re-edit it. How's it gonna be different? And people were actually really engaged and, and we, we had a lot of back and forth and I had people writing me, you know, I always thought this should have happened in the movie. And I'm like, we already shot it. It's like, it's, <laughs> I'm re-editing, but I'm not going back and reshooting things. You know, it's, it's been a while. I think everybody's aged at this point. But, um, you know, just looking to go back and re-edit it and, and get it closer to the vision that I had for it. And they were just so excited and engaged. And when the movie came out, it was instantly great. I mean, it was instant, uh, instantly profitable. And one of the coolest things about it was I didn't even release it for people to rent or purchase. I released it directly to uh, Amazon Prime and Tubi TV. And that was it. Just those two platforms. Just those two platforms. Now, it's, it's since expanded, but just, I would even say, even if you remove Amazon from the equation, which, you know, if most filmmakers haven't, they should, in terms of AV or in terms of SVOD, you should remove that from, the, from your overall vision of how much money the movie's gonna make and really focus on places like Tubi because that's where I would say 95% of the revenues come from, has been from Tubi. And with Tubi, are there forced ads? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you, you have to watch the ads. Sure, sure. You have to okay, watch great. the ads. And, mm -hmm. and I think every movie, it starts with like two or three ads and then it goes into the movie and then a few minutes in, it's another four or five ads and then it go. And so if you keep people engaged, if you have quality content, you keep people engaged, each time they pass one of those commercials, you're making more money. And so, you know, that's the name of the game is, is ABOD for, for certain movies, for certain movies. Now, if you have a movie like, you know, like the, my most recent film, One to One, if you have something like that where you have, you know, a couple of names that are in the movie that people recognize, that's something you want to really push and see what TVOD has to offer, transactional video, because the odds are a lot of people will go there to rent or purchase that film uh, because they recognize those people and because the content may be something they're interested in. Did you use an aggregator to get it on Tubi or 
Amazon Prime or these other, you said uh, with the V, mm -hmm. sorry, with the wants and want, you put yeah, it on yeah. other. Yeah, uh, with the smaller films, I go through Film Hub, actually. Film Hub is a great resource, um, because mainly because I, I think for most people, the barrier to entry is too high um, from going with a traditional aggregator because they're gonna charge you per platform. They're gonna, first of all, have a set fee, and then any platform after that is another fee and another fee and another fee and another fee, right? Now, if you anticipate, and when I say anticipate, I don't mean hope, but you, you've actually done the homework and you anticipate making, I don't know, uh, 500 grand, right? Let's, I'm just gonna use that ballpark figure. If you anticipate making 500 grand from your film and you went through an aggregator, then you paid them up front. So that's all they got. So if you paid them, if you paid them up front and it was, 2,500 bucks, then that's all they got. And you got all the rest of that money. But if you went through Film Hub, well, Film Hub, you didn't pay anything up front. They take, I think it's I think it's 10%. So if they're taking 10%, then they took $50,000, which is huge. But if you anticipate because you've done the research and you know films in your certain budget range, they maybe only hit a certain number, then and you know that you're gambling anyway, then Film Hub is better because there's no real barrier to entry. You can just put the film in, see how it does, and let's say you you crap out at ten thousand, right? Game's over. It's made up. It's made ten thousand, and from now it's petering out. Um, then you didn't spend anything to get into the game. And if you if Film Hub takes their percentage, they've only taken a thousand dollars. Is there a period of time when the film kind of peaks, or it depends on the title? In terms of like viewership, is it the first month? I think it all depends. I think it depends on your how you've promoted the film, or if you even know anything about promoting, because I didn't in the beginning, and I know my film came out, and I know people were watching it but I had no idea how they were watching it. Um, I never sent them anywhere to watch it. Um, it grew a following, but I, I don't know how much of that was, how much of that was from them finding the actual places where it was being shown and watching it through there or just watching a pirated link. I would have no way of knowing because I never, I never invested the time in understanding how to market to an audience. So I didn't have that information at my disposal but um, you know as I as I moved more into understanding the marketing of a film I can say that I usually will feed that audience engage that audience and then point them to where I need them to go and I can watch the film through every quarter actually with film hub because you know you can piece out the rights you can you know, take the rights and do this by yourself, and then Film Hub only handles this. But of everything I'm seeing, I can see it month by month, what's happening, you know, and see how much money I'm generating, how many views I'm getting month over month. And I usually find that in the first quarter, that's where you get the larger number of people viewing your film, because that's when it's still hot. That's when it's its most exciting and everybody wants to watch it and see what happens. And then it starts to kind of find a, a little medium and it rise that probably for another two quarters. And when you say piece out the rights, what mm -hmm. does that mean? Meaning you own it in perpetuity, but then they own it for certain time, certain amount of uses? No, actually Film Hub doesn't, they, you, you're not even, you're, you're licensing it to them, but it's for no predetermined amount of time. So at any moment you can just stop it. You can say, you know what, I, I'm not liking this anymore. I'm just gonna stop it now. Okay. And you can choose to do so. And what I mean by piecing out is, you know, if you're going to, I mean, it's different now, but in the beginning, if you wanted to keep Amazon rights for yourself, because ultimately, why would you want somebody to upload to Amazon when you could do that yourself? So for a lot of people, they kept the Amazon rights themselves, and then they would put the rest of their you know, 
the rest of the platforms on, on uh, Film Hub. And then they will make all their money that way. And so <clears throat> as Amazon has moved away from allowing direct uploads for Prime, they've moved away from that recently. So I say recently like it was just now, but I think it was beginning of 2021. They, they moved away from that model. So yes, you can upload your film and it can be TVOD for rent for purchase, but it won't go to Amazon Prime unless it was put up by another distributor or an aggregator. Really? Do you know why yeah. they did that? I mean, the rumor is that it was because so much of Prime was cluttered with not that quality content. Because people were saying, oh, it's a feature film, and really it was just a bunch of episodes of a, uh, you know, something they put on YouTube, like, <laughs> you know, like a, like a, um, you know, them, um, what was one of the ones that was like a tutorial on something like nails and stuff or something, and they just put together a bunch of episodes and it equaled out to like 45 minutes, and then they just uploaded that, and now that's considered a movie. And so I think Amazon just, they got enough backlash from that, um, and they decided, you know, it's, it's not worth it for us to allow people to do that. Now we need somebody curating that content. I think that was part of it. I think the other part of it too is ultimately Amazon creates their own content. And so you're, even though, I know, I know a lot of people think that we're not really in competition with, with Amazon because, you know, they have these huge big shows that are watched by hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people. We're not competing with that. And essentially, yes, you are. You just, not you by yourself, but if you and you and him and her and we all got together and there was a thousand films that hit Amazon Prime, if you add up all the people watching that content, it is rivaling their shows. It's taking attention away from the stuff that they've created. So I think it's those two reasons in tandem that really pushed them to make that decision and say, you know what, I think, let's put an end to this, let's make it a curated thing where at worst, I'm sorry, at best, they're gonna have to go through through Film Hub, you know? And, and I think so many people still don't know about Film Hub. And I, I think if you, if you knew about Film Hub as, a, as an independent filmmaker, you would never rely on another predatory distributor again. You never would because you realize they're completely inconsequential. You can give your film away to this guy over here who will make money off your film and you'll never see a dime. Or you can do it yourself and put it on Film Hub and chances of you seeing money is far greater. You know, It would keep people out of making some really bad, bad deals with distributors with bad intent. You know. And do they have certain specs that they require? Aspect Film ratios, hub? yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. They they do they do specify the the formats that you must submit, and they do specify you know how many moments of black you know that you can have, so that the films are pretty uniform. So you're not having more than I think more than two seconds of black at the beginning, and not more than two seconds of black at the end. That sort of thing, just so that movies start, you know. Because I know there are people who try to pad things out and, oh, you know, if I throw on two minutes of black at the beginning and five minutes of black at the end, you know, my movie's now 83 minutes. <laughs> so I think they try to do that. But, but ultimately, it's just something to keep it uniform. Why have you put your films on Tubi? At the moment, it's probably the greatest revenue generator um, because people get to watch it for free. It's a free app that's in pretty much, I would say almost every English speaking territory and even some non-English speaking territories. So it's widely available, uh, just as much so as Amazon Prime. And you know, it's, it runs off ad revenue, so it's completely free, unlike Amazon Prime, where you have to have a membership, you know, whatever you pay per year, your annual membership. With Tubi, you just download the app to your phone or to the computer or to your television and you know, you're able to watch films completely for free. It's just everything, all the revenue is generated from, from ad, advertisements, so. We recently heard that a filmmaker said that he made like six figures from Tubi. Mm -hmm. um, 
Can you tell us your experience? Uh, six figures, yeah, definitely possible. Uh, I think it depends upon a lot of factors. I don't know if this filmmaker did it on one film because that's a different set of factors versus he just had a bunch of his films on there and that's a different set of factors. But depending upon the factors, yeah, certainly. All that, all that, really, all that really needs to happen is that you drive an audience that you've been interacting with to Tubi, you know? The only, the only pushback I would say I received in terms of, of why someone hasn't viewed a film of mine on Tubi was just that they didn't know what Tubi was, they didn't know how much it was gonna cost, so they didn't bother to download it. That's the only thing. I think that as more people become acquainted with Tubi, I think that that's gonna be the place to go to, to place a film. And I've actually been in, in talks with them so that I don't have to go through an aggregator in order to place films there because all they really want to see is that they're not dealing with a filmmaker who has one film. They want to deal with someone who has multiple films so that they aren't just dealing with one-offs of having to have different bank accounts to pay or whatever. So that's why they deal with aggregators. That's why they deal with distributors because they're just paying one person for a lot of films versus one-offs. So you don't have, let's say, a dashboard within Tubi that you can go and see what you made for this quarter? I don't have it uh, because I don't have a direct relationship with them yet, but I'm about to have a direct relationship with them. Uh, for right now, I see all of my revenue projections from Film Hub. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. great. Why do you place such an emphasis on owning your own movies? I believe that that is the only way to operate with any type of freedom in this industry. To be tethered to a committee, to be tethered to someone who holds the purse strings, it just, already this, <laughs> this industry, you have to have a thick skin already. And it's an artistic industry. It's not like it's, you know, being an accountant or something. It's, it's actually, you relying on your own creativity and your ability to take what's ever in your head and apply it in reality to make it come true, right? You're trying to do all these things and, and ultimately you have so many people around you that, are, that could be, whether it's negatively or positively, influencing that and manipulating it. And they don't mean to. They don't mean to. It's not like, I don't think many people are out to just screw you over with bad ideas. I think that everybody just wants their own thing. They want their own imprint on whatever it is. And it really hampers your, your freedom and your ability to grow. But if you, if you were able to finance your own projects and you were able to uh, understand the distribution process so that you understand how much money you generate from that, then you've taken so much of your own financial freedom and your creative freedom into your own hands. That's why I really emphasize owning your own rights and not, I don't even license my stuff out unless I know that this person can do something that I can't do. And even then, I'm only licensing the rights to them for the things that I can't do on my own. And that's it. Because I know that if I license it, license it to them for, I don't know, two, three years, that's two or three years that I'm tied to them on this specific thing. And if I learn how to do that in that specific, in that during that time, I can't even do anything about it because they're already doing it. So I have to wait until their license is up before I can do it myself because I like, to, I like holding me accountable. I like making myself responsible because that's the only way I know for sure 100% that it will get done and get done to the level that I would do it or that I want it to be done. So. In all of this, what I'm trying to do is, is take all of my projects and use them to not only express myself artistically, but also to provide my own security moving forward. You know, 